to our forum for the candidates for the Office of Representative to the United States Congress from the 1st Congressional District of Oregon. I'm Mary McWilliams, President of the League of Women Voters of Portland. We are pleased to have the American Association of University Women as our partner in presenting this forum. Following Congressman David Wu's resignation, Governor Kitzhopper scheduled a special general election for January 31, 2012 to fill Congressman Wu's seat. We invited all candidates who are running for this office to participate in this forum. We are pleased that all four candidates are here. To reach voters in all five counties of the 1st Congressional District, we decided to tape this forum without an audience and to make it available through a link on our website for voters to view at their convenience. Voters can also view the forum on local access cable television in Multnomah, Washington, and Yamhill counties. The schedule for those playbacks appear on our website, lwvpdx.org. Many of you saw our request for questions in your local newspaper or in an email from an organization you belong to. Because the League of Women Voters and the American Association of University Women believe questions for the candidates should represent the interests of the voters and communities of the 1st Congressional District, we asked newspapers and organizations throughout the 1st Congressional District to ask their readers and members to submit questions for us to pose to the candidates in this forum. The response was robust. We have received many more questions than we can use in this forum. We have tried to select individual questions that represent the interests and issues expressed in all the questions submitted. The League is also producing a nonpartisan voter's guide for the January 31 special general election. The Voter's Guide allows all candidates an equal opportunity to respond to several questions. You can find the Voter's Guide on our website, lwvpdx.org, and also at votesource.org. Paper copies of the Voter Guide will be available in libraries and in the county clerk or elections offices in Clatsop, Columbia, Multnomah, Washington, and Yamhill counties. Now, let me introduce our moderator, Dr. James Moore. Dr. Moore is the director of the Tom McCall Center for Policy Innovation at Pacific University in Forest Grove, where he is also a professor of politics and government. We very much appreciate that Dr. Moore generously and enthusiastically agreed to our request that he moderate today's forum. Dr. Moore, I turn the program over to you. Thank you, Mary. It's always good to uh, help democracy move along here. Now, let's introduce the candidates. They are in alphabetical order, Suzanne Bonamici, who's the Democratic nominee, Rob Cornelis, who's the Republican nominee, James Foster, who's the nominee of the Libertarian Party, and Stephen Reynolds, the nominee of the Progressive Party. As we proceed with the forum, each candidate will have one minute to answer each question. If it appears that a candidate needs to clarify a response, I'll ask the candidate to do so, and the candidates will have an additional 15 seconds to provide that clarification. Our two timekeepers, hidden in the dark in the studio, will signal each candidate to stop when his or her time has expired, and just in case, I may jump in. So, let's begin. Okay, our first question goes to Suzanne Bonamici. Do you favor having coal export facilities located on the Columbia River? Thank you, Jim, and thank you to the League of Women Voters. We need to do everything we can to build the economy. However, I support clean energy sources like wind and solar and wave exploration, which is happening over on our coast in the district. We have a lot of renewable energy industry here already in Oregon, and we need to further the renewable energy industry that we have uh, uh, everywhere across the 1st Congressional District and across this state. So what I favor is clean, renewable energy sources and getting people back to work across the district. Excellent. Thank you. Mr. Cornelis. Well, I'm, uh, I'm very grateful to be a resident of the 1st Congressional District because this is a very richly blessed district. We have so many things to take advantage of and, and to be grateful for. One of those things is that we're leaders when it comes to innovation, especially in renewable energy. 
And I think that we need to consider this as not only a way that we can be leaders throughout the country, but also a way that we can grow jobs and, and build up the communities, especially in the rural areas of the first district. So whether that's through uh, natural gas pipelines, whether that's through geothermal, whether it's uh, wind and solar, we need to be, again, innovative in these areas and recognize that these are job-creating opportunities. At the same time, we need to be responsible to the environment because Oregonians are naturally environmentalists. So we need to be careful to make sure that we protect the vi environment, that we protect property rights uh, of owners of, pro of private property, and that we also grow businesses in a sustainable way. Thank you. Mr. Foster? Thank you. It's good to be here. As others have said, we do need to provide jobs, and we need to have, find ways to grow our economy in the 1st Congressional District. One of the challenges, however, is asking the question, what is the federal government's role in each of these areas? And the question of what sort of industries should we have sounds a lot like an industrial planning sort of regime. And I don't think that that's the responsibility of particularly the federal government to be telling the residents of the 1st Congressional District what sort of businesses they should have. Now, if there's areas such as eminent domain and other things that involve limiting our property rights, then we should certainly be interested in those things. But otherwise, we should leave it to the local authorities and citizens. Thank you. Thank you very much. Mr. Reynolds. No, I do not support putting in a coal export facility on the Columbia River. I think we need to be doing everything we can to encourage the growth and adoption of renewable energy sources. It's important. Oregon has a technology-based economy, and they are producing the renewable energy resources that we need. We need to encourage those through investment and tax incentives any way we can. We do not want to be encouraging coal mining. We do not want to be encouraging fracking for natural gas. Those are the things we do not want. I don't want those kind of jo jobs in Oregon at all. Okay, thank you very much. We'll now move to question number two. Please discuss two or three things that must be done with respect to federal regulation of the financial system to reduce the chances we'll have a recurrence of the 2007-2008 financial system meltdown. Mr. Cornelis, you'll be the first one on this one. Well, first of all, the Dodd-Frank bill, which was passed in last year's Congress, obviously uh, proved to be uh, much more than we expected, or much more than I think Congress anticipated. It's thousands of pages of regulation that even the regulators are still trying to work through, and lawyers will take years to try to figure out how they apply those regulations to business. And if anyone can suggest that the Dodd-Frank bill actually makes lending or borrowing money faster or simpler, then they're probably not someone who is engaged in job creation. Because that's, in fact, what's gone on right now, is we've got a, a system that's where, where money is being constrained. And that's why money's not going out into, into the entrepreneurial community, into the business community, so they can use that for investing and hiring. So we have to make sure that we protect consumers, and that's one good thing from the Dodd-Frank bill that was included, a consumer protection clause. But now we have to free up the markets to do what they do best, and that is invest. Thank you very much. Mr. Foster. Thank you. Like most Americans, I am deeply concerned about the economy and the uncertainty that has occurred, particularly in the last few years. I believe that a lot of this is due to what's called the moral hazard, where the institutions that are deemed too big to fail end up getting bailed out so that we end up privatizing profits and socializing losses. This cannot continue. We need to stop the bailouts of the financial, the auto company, and other industries. We should liquidate Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac, the other organizations that have been involved in bringing a great deal of uncertainty to the economic situation. We should repeal those parts of the Community Reinvestment Act that encourage lending to poor risk borrowers. Other things can be done. Thank you. Mr. Reynolds? I think financial reform is key to bringing our economy back. We need to re-implement Glass-Steagall. We need to separate the banks from the investment arms that they've acquired. They're, they're gambling with, with their money and with their members' money. Uh, it, we need to stop that immediately. Uh, we need to implement the financial transaction tax. Stop this instantaneous con uh, computer trading that is causing these huge swings in our markets. Uh, it 
causes a lack of confidence. People are, don't feel like they're being treated, by their, treated right by the markets. Um, we also need to enable the Consumer Protection Bureau. It's been implemented, it's been created, but they're fighting right now about putting a head on it. And we need to give it teeth. It needs to be able to protect consumers from the banks, from the predators uh, in our financial industry. Thank you very much. And Ms. Bonamici. Thank you. Yes, th this is an area I've worked on for much of my career. I started out uh, at Legal Aid helping families who were uh, struggling and then worked on these issues at the Federal Trade Commission in Washington, D.C. I support uh, Dodd-Frank in implementation of the Consumer Protection Financial Protection Bureau, especially the consumer education uh, protections and better disclosure to consumers. Those are critical to making sure we don't have another financial crisis. I also support reinstating Glass-Steagall to separate out the uh, uh, commercial and investment parts of banking to make sure we do not have another situation where we have institutions that are too big to fail. We also need to make sure that we rebuild consumer confidence. And one of the ways we can do that is to make sure that we give homeowners every opportunity possible to prevent foreclosure. There are preventable foreclosures. We need to be keeping people in their homes, allowing them every opportunity to modify their loans, to stay in their homes, and rebuild that consumer confidence. Thank you very much to all of you. Now, question number three. Recent figures from the U.S. Census Department show that one child in every five in Oregon lives in poverty. That the percentage of Oregon residents using food stamps in, is the highest in the nation and that the number of homeless K-12 public school students in Oregon has been steadily increasing, uh, homeless students have been steadily increasing for several years. Given all this rather depressing data, would you promise to oppose efforts to balance the federal budget by cutting federal anti-poverty programs. So we'll start with you, Mr. Foster. For 40 years, we've had engaged in a war on poverty and have had very little success to show from it. There's many things that should be done, perhaps at the local level and at the community level, individual um, involvement, nonprofit organizations. But no, I would not oppose um, reining in the federal budget in an effort to continue helping the so-called war on poverty. Like others, I am concerned about what's happening in the economic area and with the jobs and families. When I participate in our church's community service organization, I see the problems. But I don't think that the federal government should have a role in extending involvement here. Thank you very much. Mr. Reynolds. I, I support the programs that feed families. They're important. There are families out there that are struggling. People in the first congressional district are hurting, and these programs are keeping them alive. We need, to, we need to expand these services. We need to eliminate these tax incentives and these subsidies for these mega farm corporations. We need to encourage local sourced food in our communities. We can do that by eliminating, one, the subsidies for the mega corporations and increasing the subsidies for our community farms, our community-based organizations that are providing healthy food to our, to our communities. Okay, thank you. Ms. Bonamici? Thank you. I did a lot of volunteer work in the Beaverton schools when my uh, kids went through the Beaverton School District. And I know that currently there are more than a thousand homeless students in the Beaverton School District. And that's just heartbreaking. And I'm sure that the numbers are high, way too high across the first congressional district. I would oppose cuts to programs that are designed to help families get out of poverty. In fact, in this last legislative session, I helped bring more after school meal programs to uh, after school programs across the state of Oregon because unfortunately there are too many kids who are hungry and too many people fighting poverty. What we need to do is get people back to work so they can rise out of poverty, but importantly we need to not cut funding for things like education, which is really the income equalizer. When students, regardless of background, have an opportunity to an equal education, they themselves can graduate and get living wage jobs. So I'm not interested in cutting those programs that are helping people rise out of poverty. I won't be cutting Head Start or funding for public education. Thank you. And Mr. Cornelis? Well, the fact that Oregon children are now ranked as first, top of the list in food insecurity, is something that no Oregonian should be proud of. 
And uh, certainly we shouldn't be proud of, uh, of the fact that we have policies and practices in Oregon that continue to, to, to put a crimp on our economy. This is a question that obviously comes down to jobs. These, these children need parents who are working, who are actively involved in their community and producing. And, and so that's the number one issue of this election, is how are we going to create jobs for these, for these families? And I would not support anything that would take away from families, especially the most vulnerable. I would also encourage all voters to participate in the Oregon Food Bank, not just this time of year, but throughout the year. And these kids not only deserve a good lunch, they also deserve a good education. This is why I'm pleased to announce that the chairwoman of the Beaverton School District is now endorsing my candidacy because she knows that I will work hard for these children, not just in the classroom, but to make sure they have opportunities for careers after the classroom. Thank you all very much. Now we're going to turn to the issue of undocumented workers, something that is quite amusing around the country these days. Do you favor a federal law that would mandate public and private employers' use of E-Verify, the online federal system that enables employers to quickly vet prospective employees for proof of U.S. citizenship or for legal residence? And we're going to start with you, Mr. Reynolds. No, and I think it's proving out in Alabama. They recently passed a law that that does exactly that. And they have produce rotting on the vines. They can't get American workers to come in and work for literally a dollar or two an hour. Um, I don't think that's the right way to go about it. We need, to, we need to enable these workers. We need to bring them into our society legally. We need an amnesty program and we need to enact the DREAM Act. Um, we need to provide H-1B visa holders an opportunity to citizenship through their work here. We need to c encourage immigration. It's, it's what our country was founded upon, and it's what it's going to continue to drive our success. Thank you. Ms. Bonamici? Uh, thank you. We, we absolutely have to discuss immigration. The system is broken, and we need a federal solution. We need to tighten up on our borders, especially crack down on trafficking, people who are uh, engaged in human trafficking across the border and drug trafficking. That's critical. Uh, and we need to come up with a way for a path to citizenship for those who are here and not violating our laws. I cannot support E-Verify because it's notoriously unreliable and it's created too many problems. If we had a system that was uh, accurate, I would consider it, but I don't support E-Verify. Thank you. Mr. Cornelis? Well, certainly, uh, illegal immigration is a problem that's affecting all facets of our society. As it relates to E-Verify, I would support a more reliable, more efficient E-Verify system, one that doesn't put an undue burden on, on employers and that drives up their costs, which in turn drives up the cost for the, all consumers. As it relates to immigration as a whole, though, we have to recognize where the genesis of the problem is. It's at our borders. It's at our ports. These need to be secured. And I'm happy to say, as the first congressional representative moving forward, if the voters will have me, I, I will be championing the district by recognizing that we have businesses and industries here in the first district that can solve this problem using the technologies and the innovation that we're known for. And, and not only th doing that, but also making sure that we recognize that there has to be a simpler, more efficient way of encouraging legal immigration. Right now, it's an onerous system. It's too cumbersome, and that's what's causing people to take dr dr dramatic and desperate measures. Thank you very much. And Mr. Foster. Immigration has been a vibrant part of our society and the United States s since its founding. And until 1920s, we had essentially open immigration and had a very good growth and positive benefits from it. The challenges from immigration now would not be solved by something like E-Verify. And the idea that we could have something better or more efficient is again just a dream that if we put the right people in charge, we can make government work better. And the problem is that we should not be trying to turn our employers into deputies to enforce our immigration laws. Okay, thank you very much. Now, we're going to shift gears back to the district here, looking at economics. What will you do to promote development of green industries in the first congressional district? And Ms. Bonamici, we'll start with you. 
Thank you. Uh, I will be promoting green energy industries as well as many other industries uh, because jobs in the economy are uh, the key uh, considerations of people in this district. Uh, I have supported in the past uh, incentives for renewable energy industry at the state level and will support those in Congress as well. I am also uh, going, going to continue the work that I started at the state level of getting uh, capital to businesses in Oregon. Uh, for startup businesses and for d traded sector businesses. That is a, an important part of getting people back to work right now. And finally, I am going to be uh, on from day one supporting an infrastructure project that encourages development on uh, things like our electrical grid, and that is going to help further the renewable energy industry in the first congressional district and across the state. We can be a leader in this area if we have the leadership in Congress who will create the infrastructure bill and jobs for the industries. Thank you very much. And Mr. Cornelis. Well, it's imperative that the first district elects someone who can actually work with others in Congress. And I can do that and I intend to do that, regardless of their party, because we have to put all ideas on the table and, and recognize that we have one thing in common, even though our party affiliation may be different, and that is we want to grow jobs and we want to grow this economy. As it relates to the green industries, I think the first representative needs to be, needs to be considerate of all industries. How do you do that? You do three simple things which I outlined in my jobs plan just released and in a presentation that I made to community leaders who asked the senator and I to both appear. And when I appeared and was the only one there, I suggested that we must simplify our tax code. We must give more predictability both to consumers and businesses. We must be a, a proponent and champion of trade, especially what we do well here in the first district, so that the world can buy our products and services. And we also must have fiscal responsibility in Congress by being serious about a balanced budget amendment over time so it doesn't hurt our, our country. Thank you. Mr. Foster? Again, what you're likely to hear from political candidates is, if you put me in charge, I can solve the problems. I have a plan. If we invest in this industry, then we'll grow. We've heard that before. We saw with the Obama Energy Department investment in green jobs, how the day after the election, they announced massive layoffs. These are the sort of things that we can expect from central planning. Instead, what we need to do, as Mr. Cornelius has suggested, is allow a neutral growth, allow jobs to be created in a variety of areas, and not to try to choose the winners and losers. Thank you. And Mr. Reynolds. Obviously, green energy is an important driver of our economy here in Oregon. Uh, Solar World recently filed an ITC complaint against companies in China dumping cheap solar panels on our markets. We need to hold our trading partners accountable. We cannot, and we, American workers should not compete, or have to compete rather, with companies and countries that poison their environment and exploit their workers. It's not fair. We need to invest in an energy grid that will allow us to move these, the, the massive amounts of energy that are being created by these wind turbines in, in the Columbia Valley, um, to the people, to people who need it. There is a problem. There is a maximum capacity right now of this wind, and it's, we can't even use it because we can't sell it to anybody. And that, we need to address that. Um, we need to invest in more infrastructure in, in this country, I, especially broadband uh, adoption. It's, it's disgusting. America is 52nd in the world behind Latvia and Estonia as far as broadband adoption goes, and I'm not okay with that. Okay, thank you. Now we'll, we'll shift to the ever popular social sphere just a bit here. So one of you is gonna be my representative in Congress come in January 31st or probably February 1st. We'll look at the clock there and see how that works. Um, will you support an effort to repeal DOMA, the Defense of Marriage Act? And will you vote for repeal when such a bill comes to the floor of the House? Mr. Cornelis, we'll start with you. Well, the Defense of Marriage Act was enacted by a bipartisan effort in Congress, and it was signed by a Democrat president, President Clinton. And recently, as was suggested by your question, Jim, there has been uh, some movement in the administration to overturn that. I think we have to recognize that this is a state's issue, how states define uh, marriage or how they want to look at civil unions. 
Uh, I myself have been in a heterosexual marriage for 25 years. But I think it's very important that we recognize, as this is a sensitive issue, that it's very difficult to legislate who someone will love or who they should love. And I don't think that's government's role. But I do think, as it relates to this issue, if you put it into the states and let them decide, as Oregon has done and put it to the voters, I think this, each state will make the decision that's best for them and for their culture. And that's why we have domestic partnerships today in Oregon, which I do support. Thank you much. Mr. Foster? Federal marriage law is a muddle of more than 1,100 rights, responsibilities, prerogatives, and duties, tax breaks, and so on. There is so much social engineering that goes on that's unnecessary. Yes, I would support repeal of the Defense of Marriage Act because I don't think that the federal government should have a role in that. I think that, yes, we should leave it up to the states, let the states make decisions in their local environment as what's best for them. Thank you very much. Mr. Reynolds. I absolutely would repeal the DOMA Act. It's tragic legislation that's based upon spite and misunderstanding and, and ignorance, really. Uh, there are families, strong families, of, in the LGBT community that deserve the respect and, of the rule of law. They need to be able to visit their families in emergency rooms. They need to be qualified for the tax incentives and, and encouragements of the, and programs that the government offers to families. Absolutely repeal the DOMA Act. Thank you. And Ms. Bonamici. Yes, I would support repeal of the Defense of Marriage Act. Well, one of the problems with the Defense of Marriage Act is that for those states that do permit uh, gay marriage, like Massachusetts, for example, New York, uh, those people don't have their marriages recognized in other states. I would support the repeal, uh, absolutely. Uh, I've been married to my husband for 26 years, and I don't see any reason why uh, two people who love each other and are committed should not be able to marry. And yes, I would support repeal of Defense of Marriage. Thank you. You know, this district uh, covers all of Northwest Oregon. We tend to get candidates who live basically in the Portland area, but I'm sure you're all putting lots of miles on your cars as you're covering the district. Be glad you're not in the second congressional district, which is bigger than every state east of the Mississippi River. Uh, this one is from somebody in Astoria. Living near the waterfront in Astoria, there's no single more important question to my family right now where do you stand on the process of fracking for natural gas that has been going on across the country and the liquefied natural gas industry's plan to export it through Astoria? And Mr. Foster, we'll start with you. Thank you. The liquefied natural gas pipeline is, yes, quite controversial. On the other hand, the question I need to ask is, what is the federal government's role in this question? Why isn't property and pipeline, construction, and other things like this that are happening solely within a state's borders, a local issue. If there is eminent domain being used to take property, particularly from people who don't want their farmlands taken, then yes, I would oppose that. But the opposition would be to protect property rights and allow owners of the land to decide how that land is going to be used. Thank you. Mr. Reynolds? I'm absolutely against the unregulated export of liquefied natural gas. Make no mistake, make no mistake this isn't about jobs. This is about commoditizing liquid natural gas. Right now we have a regional issue uh, where natural gas, the price is set upon the, how much is produced in the region. We in America have a competitive advantage with the rest of the world. Our industry and our manufacturing rely on cheap natural gas. If we allow it to be exported, the, the cost to consumers and businesses, they could increase by a factor of four. Uh, that, that affects people's ability to heat their homes, it affects people's ability to cook their food, and it affects people's ability to live their lives. And I'm not okay with that at all. Thank you. Ms. Bonamici? You're right, uh, Jim. I have put a lot of miles on my car and several trips to Astoria and talked to many people out there who are genuinely concerned about liquefied natural gas. I do not support uh, if fracking. I have environmental concerns with that and environmental concerns in general about liquefied natural gas and property rights concerns about the pipelines that need to be laid across some prime agricultural land out in the 1st Congressional District. Uh, I do support uh, increasing 
uh, jobs in the renewable energy sector and not with liquefied natural gas. And I'm very concerned about the discussions of exporting LNG because it is shown that it will drive up costs. And with struggling families right now, that's what they don't need is costs going up. Let's focus on renewable energy that is clean, that is proven, that won't be challenged, that won't affect people's pr uh, private property rights. Uh, let's do the wave exploration and wind and uh, create jobs that way. Thank you. And Mr. Cornelis. Well, this is a, an issue that I hear on both sides. I hear people that are concerned about property rights. I hear people that are obviously concerned about the environment here in Oregon. And these are valid concerns that any representative needs to be sensitive to. But I also hear concerns from people who want jobs, who want their rural communities to be built up again and see some economic activity. As it relates to the pipeline, just like in the last election, I support LNG, but here's what I don't believe. I don't believe the federal government or federal officers should be dictating where it goes. I think it should be up to the local citizens and officials. But one thing we have to remember here in Oregon, we have cheap energy right now. We need to keep it cheap. And if exporting is going to drive up costs, that's something we need to look very seriously at. But the fact that Amazon and Google have recently moved to Oregon because of our cheap energy costs, this is a good sign. They like what we do here. We need to do more of it, but we need to do it responsibly, safely, affordably. Thank you. Now we'll move on to an issue near and dear to the major voters in these elections because the older you are, the higher tendency there is for you to vote. So Social Security. Okay, how would you protect Social Security for today's seniors and strengthen it for future generations? And Mr. Reynolds, we're going to start with you. I think we need to stop talking about Social Security cuts and talk, start talking about strengthening Social Security. The first thing I would do, would I, be elim I would eliminate the $106,000 cap on income. I don't think that's fair. I think that Social Security is a benefit that everyone is entitled to and everyone should pay the same amount, uh, <laughs> scaling to their income, obviously. Um, Social Security is, is a contract that America enters into when it joins the workforce. Every single American has been paying into it if they have a job, and every single American is due the benefits that they are expecting. Uh, we need to, to do whatever needs to be done, raise taxes, and it's, <laughs> we need to protect Social Security for everybody. Thank you. Ms. Bonamici. Protecting and strengthening Social Security uh, is a priority of mine. And I went out and rode around rural Washington County last year with somebody delivering food with Meals on Wheels. And I know that there are people who rely on Social Security. They need that income uh, to eat, to pay their medical bills. So it's a critical, critical program. It's a promise that we've made to our seniors. And it's a matter of priorities. I favor eliminating uh, the, the uh, tax breaks that are going to, and subsidies that are going to big oil companies. That will put more dollars on the table. I f uh, favor letting the Bush tax cuts on millionaires expire. That will put more dollars on the table. We are bringing home our troops, and I'm glad for that. We need to have services for them when they come back, but once they come back, look at the defense budget, and the money we'll be saving there. That will put more money on the table. It's a matter of priorities. Thank you. Mr. Cornelis? Thank you, Jim. I think it's very important that voters understand that if they will elect me, I will not encourage or support the privatization of Social Security. Social Security, as was stated earlier, is a contract. Everyone's paid into the system. They deserve for it to be there, especially our seniors who are relying on it today in this very tough economy. So how do we, how do we make sure that it's there for future seniors? Well, this is where responsibility comes into play. This is where bipartisanship is necessary. And, and I am one who is ready and willing to work with anyone who's, who's well, willing and ready to reason. And one of the things that's very encouraging to me is the Simpson-Bowles report, which was issued a year ago this month, as commissioned by President Obama, had bipartisan ideas to save Social Security for the future. Unfortunately, we have too much partisanship in Washington, D.C., and they haven't opened up the book of that commission's report and done anything reasonable or, or anything that would actually create results. I want to go back and open up that book and get started. Thank you. Mr. Foster? The current path for Social Security and the other entitlement programs is not sustainable. That's what prompts this question. Politicians can promise we won't do anything to change it, 
And what that means is that we will eventually, sooner rather than later, run out of money. We need to start making serious in changes and consideration of what's to be done sooner rather than later. The existing system is discriminatory against the young, against the poor, and minorities who pay more into the system than they get back. As to privatization, 64% of Americans from 18 to 29 do favor allowing an opt-out arrangement. And people should be allowed to take some of their resources and what would otherwise go in as tax and use it to invest in something that they can have to give to their heirs. Thank you very much. Now we'll shift to a question that has a lot to do with this time of year and the weather when the fog comes in. Amtrak. People want to take the train instead of driving through that muck or flying and sitting in an airport for hours. So Amtrak is a viable alternative to air travel, especially in the winter months and the holiday times. Are you in favor of reopening Amtrak routes, such as the Portland to Salt Lake City one and points in between, or adding train service from Portland to Astoria? What will you do to make this happen? And Ms. Bonamici, we'll start with you. Thank you. I do support uh, adding train routes and alternative transportation routes. When our roads get crowded, it makes it uh, harder for people to get to work and for goods to get to market. So yes, we need to expand train travel. Uh, we are behind many other countries in this world in terms of offering train travel as a way to commute. Uh, that will get cars off the road and again, free up the time uh, that for people to get to work, more goods to market, and more alternatives that will get cars off the road and help uh, our air be cleaner as well. So yes, we do need to increase train travel, and I will be supporting that. Thank you. Mr. Cornelis. Well, once again, you have to turn to the voters and ask them what they want. I don't think a member of Congress should be dictating anything, especially how people travel and get to work, whether it's by bicycle, car, foot, or train. So. I'm not going to sit here and say this is how I believe you ought to transport yourself. But what I will say is as a member of Congress, I believe it's my responsibility to make sure that we have an infrastructure that's conducive to driving the economy, that helps companies looking to move to Oregon see this as a viable place where they can move goods and services quickly and efficiently and certainly affordably. And also that families and individuals can do the same when they're going to work. Nothing creates more inefficiency than sitting on a freeway stuck in traffic. And I, and I know something about that, having lived in Los Angeles early in my career. But one of the things that we have to do is we have to find leaders who are willing to listen to the voters and then work collaboratively with local governments to make sure that the federal role is being applied properly with transparency and not any crony capitalism, encouraging other people to participate in doing things in those projects they shouldn't be doing. Thank you. Mr. Foster? With a few exceptions, particularly in the very crowded Northeast Corridor, Amtrak and other train arrangements are not f sound financially. Any candidate who says, I support increased use of Amtrak, trains, transportation, needs to also tell us how it will be paid for. And that's something that I think is going to be a great challenge in this arena. We've said it's viable. Well, it's viable if it's subsidized, but where is that going to be funded? We've mentioned airport delays. That's, again, I think a lot of that would be due to the TSA and other challenges there that make the airport experience much less pleasant. So no, I would not support increasing Amtrak subsidies to allow a few people to take a very pleasant trip. Thank you. And Mr. Reynolds? Yes, I support Amtrak. I think it's a great program that serves a valuable need. Um, I think we need to encourage high-speed rail adoption, especially in, in population-dense areas like the Pacific Northwest between Seattle and Portland and between the, uh, the northeast, northeastern United States. We have some of the most talented engineers and scientists in the world, but they are working on better, more efficient, faster ways to kill people. Why? We can put those people to work developing train systems and train networks and technology that would allow for alternate means of transportation. I mean, there is trillions of dollars being spent on a new fighter jet that is completely unnecessary. We need to focus our, our resources and our energy on making 
Americans' lives better, and helping people reach their goals. Thank you. Now we'll shift to something that a lot of people are thinking about across the country. Uh, we seem to be coming to the end of our uh, interest in Afghanistan and Iraq, and a lot of troops are coming home. So how do you plan to help veterans who are and will be returning from the present deployments in Iraq and Afghanistan and the families of these veterans? Mr. Cornelis, we'll start with you. Well, this is a critical question, Jim, and I'm glad it's being asked because uh, not too long ago, I took a tour of Local 290, the Steamfitters and Plumbers Union, to see how they train individuals to come into their, into their craft and into their trade. Training is absolutely key. It's something my business has been doing for years uh, with, with people who need additional training and skills to be productive and successful in the workforce. But we have to have leaders who want to bring those people from, from, from helmets to hard hats and do it in an efficient way. If there's anyone who deserves our help, and granted, we're in tough economic times right now, and, uh, and we're strained fiscally. But if there's any group or sector that deserves our help, it's those who have put their lives on the line for our country. And they deserve not only a job, they also deserve the health care that's necessary for physical rehabilitation as well as, as well as any mental rehabilitation that may be required. Thank you. Mr. Foster? Yes, we do have a commitment to our veterans, to those who have served, who are returning from active duty, who have particularly those who have been injured, whether physically or subject to psychological trauma and other things. How that's done, I'm not going to be the one to say, this is the program that we should adopt. I think that we do have expertise in the Veteran, Department of Veterans Affairs, and we need to support the programs that they have. On the other hand, I think that we should look at ways that the government might interfere with that treatment. There are returning veterans who are suffering from post-traumatic stress who have been told by their physicians that medicinal marijuana might help with that. And instead, we have the government telling them that they cannot use that. These are the things that I think we should be concerned about. Thank you. Mr. Reynolds? I am an unemployed disabled veteran, and I think, <laughs> I mean, they can't be more personal to me than, than anybody else, I suppose. Um, our veteran system, our VA healthcare system is great at what it does, but it's about to be overwhelmed. We have created a situation where there is going to be a whole generation of veterans larger than any previous generation. And the, well, maybe not any previous generation, but a large population. And I don't know if the system's ready for that. We need to streamline it. I have seen the VA system from the inside, and it's not easy. It's not easy to navigate at all. We need advocates. We need counselors. We need to increase our funding for suicide prevention. There's a tragedy in the United States. Every 90 minutes, a veteran commits suicide. I, I, I weep for, for my, my friends that are still in the military. It's, it's, a, it's a terrible thing to be, and we need to seriously address it with money and attention. Thank you very much. And Ms. Bonamici? Thank you. I want to start by thanking Mr. Reynolds for your service uh, and thanking all of those who have served our country. And, and those who are coming back, we absolutely need to have not only health care but mental health care uh, available for everyone coming back and those who are here who are veterans. I was talking to somebody the other day whose spouse works at the Veterans Hospital. She's so frustrated. She doesn't know what to do because she's so overwhelmed by the numbers of patients she needs to care for. And we have, uh, it, we're making it worse because a dysfunctional Congress cannot get funding to the Veterans Administration. Uh, that has to stop. We need leaders who can get people together and get things done, like I've done in Oregon. And thank you for asking about the families as well. I served this past session uh, on a group looking at services for military families, making sure that the family's needs are addressed. We brought together a nonprofit groups and faith communities and had a conference in Salem to talk about addressing the needs of military families. So thank you for your service. Thank you all. Sticking with health care, but moving away from the military, how would you put Medicare on stronger financial ground and protect today's seniors and future retirees from the burden of rising health care costs? And with this, uh, you know, 60-minute shot at fixing all these problems, Mr. Foster, we'll give you first crack. 
Medicare is certainly one of the great challenges, and by increasing the spending, the Bush administration has not done much to help with that. We are left with more and more challenges. Our seniors, yes, are facing health care costs that are rising. Yet the structure of the program is contributing a great deal to that. My college roommate was, is a physician, and I talked to him recently. He says that he gets $18 for a visit with a patient, and that the patients are not being well served by that sort of reimbursement. Instead, what I would suggest we need to do is allow the patient, the seniors, greater control over the spending, allow them to choose a variety, from a variety of programs instead of having the government dictating a one-size-fits-all program. Okay, thank you very much. Mr. Reynolds? Well, we can start by fully funding Medicare Part D. Uh, Congress put a poison pill in. They, they created this entitlement program where drug costs were, are fully covered, but they didn't raise taxes or account for it in the budget in any way. Uh, we need to allow Medicare to negotiate with drug companies. The VA can no negotiate with drug companies and they keep their, their medication costs low because of it. Uh, Medicare is the largest uh, health care <laughs> coverage in the, in the country. Imagine the money they could save if they were allowed legally to, to negotiate. Um, I think that the easiest way to, to ensure the long-term viability of Medicare open it to everyone, starting with the youngest people. It doesn't have to happen all at once, but instead of the most elderly and firm people being covered by Medicare, why don't we have young people in there paying into the system to help, off, help offset that cost? We're not talking about these kind of solutions, and we need to. Thank you very much. Ms. Bonamici. Uh, Medicare, again, is a, it's a matter of priorities. Too many of our seniors are relying on Medicare for us to be talking about cutting their benefits. First, we need to allow negotiation of prescription drug costs. It makes no sense for our government to be paying full price and passing that along to our seniors. We do that in the state of Oregon. We can do that uh, at the federal level as well. We also need to crack down on fraud. That will put more money on the table. Again, it's a matter of priorities. I support a Medicare over giving tax breaks to big oil companies or uh, extending tax cuts to millionaires. Medicare is the way that many of people in our society get their health care. And finally, because it is health care, we need to talk about uh, cost containment overall with health care, including having more preventive health care available and more community-based health centers available. Uh, all of those cost containment uh, measures will help. Medicare is a priority. It's uh, what our seniors need to stay healthy. And Mr. Cornelis. Well, Suzanne's right. There's a lot of fraud in the Medicare program. In fact, the Center for Medicaid and Medicare announced just recently that they're anticipating $60 billion worth of fraud this year alone in those two programs. That's a lot of money that could be spent caring for our seniors and those who need care the most. I think we look, we look at ways to drive down health care. And one of those ways is to incorporate more community health centers. And I happen to be on the board of a community health center here in Oregon. It's a fantastic organization which has demonstrated how you can lower costs and provide more care to more people who don't have the ability to pay for insurance or direct costs at a hospital. The other thing that has to be said is that Medicare Advantage cannot be taken away from our seniors. 254,000 seniors in Oregon are using Medicare Advantage. And right now, because of cuts to the, through the Affordable Care Act, which Senator Bonamici did support, they're going to see their, their out-of-pocket cost to, in Medicare Advantage increase to $473 next year alone. That's not affordable, and that's taking away their choices. Okay, thank you. You've all been very efficient in answering questions, so we've got another one for you. Uh, this is kind of the unintended cost of green changes in our lives. Since the gas tax revenues don't Cost, the cost, don't cover the cost of building and maintaining roads, and forecasts are that they will decline as people drive more efficient vehicles, electrical vehicles, all those kinds of things. What are alternative funding mechanisms that you would favor to replace the gas tax to help care for our roads and all those other things? And we'll start with Mr. Reynolds. Well, in Europe, they're testing a system based upon mileage. If you use the roads more, you pay more. I don't think that's a bad idea, but I think it might adversely affect the, the poorer elements of our society. I think we could go with a system 
similar to that, where we can subsidize maybe the the more the less wealthy of us, uh, so and allow them and allow them to go about their lives. But we can we can also lean on the the heavy consumers. Uh, by all means, charge the the eighteen wheelers more. They're destroying our roads <laughs> with their heavy loads. Um, but it needs to be fair and. It needs, if there's a system, it has to be fair. Okay, thank you. Ms. Bonamici? Well, I have an open mind on this, and it's something that uh, we started to discuss in the Oregon legislature. Uh, people are really concerned about the, the mileage uh, tax because uh, of privacy issues. What I would do is approach any uh, a possible revenue increase by looking at whether it's fair. I'm not interested in raising the gas tax right now because it's going to hurt families who are struggling and low-income families. I would look at any proposal to see what, how it impacted uh, low-income families I made sure that it was a fair proposal uh, and then uh, make a de determination on uh, whether it would get the revenue we need to repair our roads and infrastructure. Uh, that being said, there are alternative proposals for, for funding infrastructure projects like an infrastructure bank. One of those proposals is supported by both the U.S. Chamber of Congress and the AFL-CIO. So there are ways to get infrastructure funding without raising the gas tax. I will look at any proposal to make sure that it's uh, fair. Thank you. Mr. Cronillis? Well, certainly conservation has to be part of the discussion, and that's something we should always be talking about. Not legislating, but always encouraging conservation, the use of our, of our roads and our, 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 our resources, certainly our infrastructure. We do need to improve infrastructure, but I don't believe it's by raising taxes. I believe it's by creating more taxpayers, putting people more to, more to work. And in fact, this, is, this was done in a bipartisan way. In 1997, we had, a, we had a Democrat president, President Clinton, who worked with the Republican Congress and actually was able to balance the budget and see growth in our economy. When unemployment was 4%, people were working. We added 10 million taxpayers to the rolls at that time because people came together and they realized that there's a greater good rather than a party. We need to be working for people. So we need to make sure that we have policies and leaders in place who will actually encourage dialogue and even consensus building so that we grow jobs so that we can pay for these things without crimping of the economy and small businesses especially. Thank you. And Mr. Foster. The gas tax has the advantage of that it is related at least indirectly to the miles traveled. But yes, as the cars are more efficient, they're using less gas. That is, of course, something we ought to be celebrating. And if we think about the nature of why the cars are more efficient, generally more lightweight, and generally that will be less damage to the roads. So again, the gas tax is a comparatively efficient way of funding transportation for, for roads. Others have looked at toll roads, particularly for longer distances, and that has some appeal as well. The question though that I would ask before any of this is why is this a federal question for United States Congress? I think that the, we've already heard from Senator Bonamici that she's been looking at these questions in the Oregon State Legislature, and perhaps that would be the appropriate place for it to be considered. Thank you. Well, we're now going to move to closing statements. So 30 seconds to sum up to the voters why they should vote for you. So we'll conclude with a 30-second closing statement from each candidate, and we'll begin with... Ms. Bonamici. Thank you. It's no wonder people are frustrated with Congress right now. There are too many people who say anything to get elected and then they get back to Washington and forget who they represent. We absolutely need to tighten the belt of government, create jobs, and tackle the debt and the deficit, but we have to do it with the right priorities. By funding education and workforce, not giving tax breaks to big oil companies, by protecting Social Security and Medicare, not continuing tax cuts for millionaires. Now, you know I will stick with those priorities because I have a background of doing it. I'm Suzanne Bonamici, and I would be honored to earn your vote in this very special election. Thank you. Thank you. And Mr. Cornelis. Well, the viewers have heard a lot of ideas here in this forum, but one thing they have to ask themselves is which among us 
is more likely to be able to work with people in Congress to get things done for Oregon, a forgotten district. I'm pleased to tell you that I have 20 mayors in the 1st Congressional District who have come forward and endorsed me. These are Democrats, Republicans, and independent mayors because they see me as the person who is most likely to help them do what's most important right now in this election, and that is create jobs locally. Go to CornelisForCongress.com learn more about my candidacy. I would be privileged to have your vote. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Foster? Many of us are not comfortable with the traditional labels of left and right Republican Democrat because we find ourselves fiscal conservatives and yet socially tolerant. Some of you may think that a vote for a third party is a wasted vote, but I would challenge you on that. Unless the numbers are exactly equal, your vote won't make a difference in the actual outcome, but you can send a message. James Foster, for Congress will send a message that this needs to change. Thank you. And Mr. Reynolds? I'm not a politician. I don't have all the answers. Uh, this is the last federal election before the full fall 2012 cycle. Is the message we want to send to, to Washington? Everything's okay, Democrats. Everything's okay, Republicans. You just keep doing what you're doing. No, reject the Democrats reject the Republicans, send the message that we see what you're doing and we're not okay with it. Please go to my website, www.truth2012.org. I'm going to win. I just need your help. Thank you. That's all the time we have. We'd like to thank each of the candidates for participating in our forum and Metro East Community Media for recording the forum so that voters can see and hear the candidates. We also thank our timekeepers, Darlene Lemley and Debbie Kay. Uh, just so you know out there, they had to move around the studio a lot to do their jobs, but did it very well. Remember, election day is the 31st of January. Ballots must be delivered to an official drop-off site no later than 8 p.m. on Tuesday, January 31st. Postmarks do not count. So you'll hear me on the radio saying get it in to the mailbox by the Friday before. On behalf of the League of Women Voters and the American Association of University Women, thank you for watching this candidate forum. Please be informed and vote. Remember, your vote counts.